Hello, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Uh, it's Friday. We're doing sound and music. And today we're doing sound and music with Fumika Wellington, a musician in the fullest sense of the word. Hi, Fumika. Hi, Jay. <laughs> thanks for coming down. Oh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's just an honor of some sort. Oh, it's an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, and I want to I, I say that we, we named this show Live Music Education in Hawaii, but that is such a tiny topic compared to the kinds of things we can and should discuss. Mm -hmm. There's a world of things to talk about. We will never even finish a small fraction. That's a good thing, though. It is. So we can nibble at the edges, that's yep. all. Yeah. So first, I, I want to sort of introduce you to the people, all three people out there who don't know who you are. <laughs> 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 so you're a musician. and What does that mean? Um, well, I, 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 my profession is violinist. I'm a trained a conservatory trained violinist. Um, I grew up in the Honolulu Symphony. My father and mother moved here so that my father could play in the orchestra. 1956. Correct. Uh, before statehood. And in those days, uh, my father dragged me to most of the rehearsals and you know I sat in the back or on the edge of the stage or something. There were other orchestra brats, Karen Bechtel, Helen Higa, you know, there were a few of us. And, you know, we just grew up in it. And then... Did you realize you had a talent? I mean, it always is uh, inherited, isn't it? Um, talent is kind of a touchy word. I think I didn't have a choice but to learn. I mean, everybody in my family played something. And when I was small, in Hawaii, every child sang and danced. There's talent, you know, gifted and talented didn't exist. Everybody did it. Everybody did music on some level. Everybody sang. Everybody played ukulele or guitar or something, mm -hmm. you know, and there was no question of you, you're not good enough, you're not talented. I mean, I, that started later and it irritates me. I, I hate it when I hear that. My child is gifted and talented. My child is honors, blah, blah, blah. I mean, every child is talented. Every child is gifted. Did you mind if I react? I, I'd like to react. Because when I came oh. here, which was 10 years after your family came uh -huh. here, um, I felt that everybody played music. Mm -hmm. I felt that there was an ukulele everywhere. Yeah. And people were ready to burst out into song at any time. Exactly. And, and they, they didn't even know them, and they invited you to their homes mm -hmm. and parties, and they would play and drink beer together. It was, is a, it was a huge, wonderful cultural experience. And um, it went away. It doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. That's true. And I mean, I think that actually the role, you know, music and cultural activities in general are very often used to bring distinction to a community. And the difference in many um, times, like our time versus the 50s or the 60s, is the size of the community. You know, do you want to bring distinction to the people that earn more than half a million dollars a year? Or do you want to bring distinction to your island? Do you want to bring distinction to your town, your school? And now it's really, I don't think people think enough of the community at large, our state, our country, you know. Um, there's too much small thinking, and that's why stuff just, we have a lot of cultural train wrecks right now because if you think only of yourself, you're not gonna go really far. You won't get a lot of support. And um, I mean, when I think of when I was small, every public school had an orchestra and a band and a chorus. And that included the poorest schools. Every, it was considered something that we needed. And so the, the state found a way to fund it. And so now. They don't. It, they don't. And it's, there's all kinds of other things that are more important, I guess. but. Not to me, because our humanity as as a people, I think, in our state, is is compromised because we don't think on a large scale about culture, what it means actually. Um, people talk about cultural activities in terms of the dollar value, how much money can be generated, and that has nothing to do with the reason we do it. You're thinking about um, these Broadway reruns at uh, Blaisdell? For instance. Well, or 
the opposite. The orchestra, for instance, why people say it's not viable because it's too expensive. It's like saying recycling is too expensive. It's, you know, <laughs> excuse me, there's no not recycling. There's no world left to waste. So we have to do it. It doesn't matter how much it costs. It matters if we do it. And, and that's the same for me with music, um, live music in particular, because as I was saying earlier to you, we're developing now uh, a generation of, of single audiences, single listeners. Uh, everybody's got their iPod plugged in or their whatever it is, and it's one person. What's the difference? How's it? Well, there's, I mean, no, there's no community. Would you need a community for music? I think so. What's the benefit of having a community for music? Well, certainly things change. If you have a room full of listeners, the energy goes around, you know, it goes from the stage, it goes around, it goes through the public, and you feel it. It joins the people without any words, and it makes, it, it has an effect, good or bad, depending on the quality of the work, I suppose. But um, a, single, a single person, I mean, that changes everything, right? Can I, can I react to that, too? Certainly, please. I was in New York 60 days ago, maybe uh -huh. less, and I went to a play, mm -hmm. uh, Nice Work If You Can Get It, which has been running, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, 500 performances. Mm -hmm. It's really been there a while. And, uh, oh, I loved it. <clears throat> I had forgotten what it means to go to a Broadway theater, mm -hmm. different than Playstyle, different than uh, Ruger's Theater, different than any theater. Of I course, think. yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things that's different about it, aside from the red velvet seats, which are special, uh -huh. was that they're too small, and you sit very close to the guy next to you. Mm -hmm. And although you never necessarily speak with him, you you bond with him. Mm -hmm. He's a physical person right mm -hmm. next to you, and and down the row. And so by the end of the show, which was a wonderful show, everybody kind of felt a community, a physical community. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and then uh, the. The director of the show uh, stood up on the stage and she said, "You don't know this, but this is this was our last performance." <gasps> oh my! And the crowd had been giving a long standing ovation on it anyway. Uh -huh. And when she said that, they just they went crazy. Oh! And I thought to myself, "What a historic moment this is for so mm -hmm. many reasons." Mm -hmm. But you talk about the community of audience, the community. It's a, a participatory sport. Mm -hmm. It's not just you're sitting there and being, you know, like like in a television set. Mm -hmm. You're actually part of the program. Oh, absolutely. And everybody in the room was, and I had forgotten about how that works, but you're right. It's a big thing to be part of that community. Well, it's the same as sports. I mean, you know, when you go to a football game, if there's only half a stadium, it changes the game. It's not the same as when you have a full, every seat, you know, with somebody in it. And, um, you know, we say we play for one or we play for a thousand. It, of course, we say that. But, you know, if there's a lot of people, it certainly is not the same performance as if you play for one person. Yeah. That's, and if there's nobody there, it's a rehearsal. So, you know, that's not the same either. Well, it's, tell us it's about different. the violin. Tell us how, what an experience it is for you to play the violin. I, you know, the violin touches me more than any other instrument in the orchestra, but tell me about your thoughts about the violin. Well, I, I, I started when I was very, very small. I, I could. I had, you know, I was walking as two and, two and a half maybe or something, and um, my father was teaching all the time, so he said that I um, asked him for a violin because, you know, I tried to go home with some some students of his one night. I mean, I tried to get in their car when they left, and, um, and so, you know, because I wanted to be with them, and, and so he got me a violin, and I started having lessons every day and practicing. 10 or 15 minutes a day, something like that. And honestly, when I got to high school, we had this college counseling stuff. And I said, why do I have to do this? I can't do anything else. I'm never going to do anything else. I don't need to be counseled. I, I know what I'm going to do. And they looked at me like, no, no, no. You have to take this test. We'll tell you what you can do. We'll tell you where you should go to college. I said, why? You're I mean, pretty feisty even then, weren't I, you? Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't see the point, you know? And honestly, I like to do lots of things, but um, I'm comfortable playing the violin, and I, and violins fit into all kinds of different musical settings, so it's a lucky thing, you know? If you play accordion or something, you can't play everything, but violins can fit into almost any kind of music, rock and roll, jazz, 
small orchestra, big orchestra, chamber, solo. I mean, mm -hmm. so I'm lucky. And I've been lucky to work with some great, great artists in my life. So, um, what is it like uh, playing uh, in practice? You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, for example, uh, I forget the, the name of the, the violinist who played it, but uh, the music in Schindler's List, it bounces around the inside of my head every day. Uh, is that Joshua Bell? I don't remember who it is. Doesn't matter. I don't remember who the violinist is. But, but you know the music, I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. extraordinary music. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it sort of penetrates everything. It goes into into someplace deep in your in your consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, when you play alone, is it like that? It depends. You know, I mean, I think as you're, for me, playing has changed a lot since I was young. I used to uh, first I practiced because my father said to practice. Then I practiced because I wanted to be as fast and as loud as everybody else. <laughs> and then I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be a soloist. Then I wanted to be uh, a good orchestra player. And eventually, you know, practicing for me became, it's like a kind of meditation. So for me, it's, I, I, I like to practice um, just to get more inside of myself. But I didn't learn to do that until quite late. I'm speaking only for myself. But um, so playing alone and playing in the orchestra or playing chamber music, it's different kinds of all three are different. It, it's completely different yeah. and it depends uh, on the time of day too for me I, I play much better at night even if I'm not outside when it's nighttime I hear better and I f I'm more focused so um, that may be different for other people too but I think people for me when it's dark your ears come more alive so um, yeah I'm reminded of, uh, correct me if I got the name wrong, it's Samuel Wan, yes. the, the, uh, the conductor, mm -hmm. for some years, mm -hmm. uh, who was a doctor, as mm -hmm. I remember, he was also a doctor, mm -hmm. came from New York, uh, and they went back he, to New York. Yes, he came here from New York, but yeah. he's not from New York. Oh. But um, that he and came here from New York. And when he left, he got into something uh, having to do with the connection between uh, music and therapy. Yes. <laughs> And, and that's a pretty big thing, especially uh, now. A lot of musicians, um, Kyung Wa Chung has been doing music healing for many years. Um, some of my father's students that are now in New York also spend time um, going to hospitals and playing and um, senior citizens' homes and places like that. It's important. It's kind of like the thing, too, where you know people have pets that make them feel better in hospitals and stuff. Music is, is important. I, I, I went to a Kanakapila uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Eugene, Oregon mm -hmm. uh, a year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the white people, they all had ukuleles and guitars and what have you. And, mm -hmm. they, all, and they all had sheet music of all the great Hawaii songs, uh, Hapa Haole songs on forward, you know. Mm -hmm. And they played for hours. And, and I watched them, and they were in heaven. It was therapeutic. It was nostalgia. Mm -hmm. It was a, a personal kind of experience for all of them, and, and they wouldn't stop. I, it, it might have gone all night, if no, you know. And I, I say to myself, uh, it, it's much more than music it's experience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So and I miss that. I miss that from when I was small. Every weekend, you heard music any place you went, because there was no karaoke. So it was all in garages and you know people's backyards and. It was so great, and now people go into a dark room and they follow a bouncing ball and they don't have an ukulele. Right? It's just you know. I I think there's a revival though. I see more uh, ukuleles sticking out of backpacks these days than I used to. Yeah. Uh, I see people on the beach at night, you know, playing. I hope, I hope, I hope that it comes back because it's, Hawaii has been the home of so many great musicians and even. Today, there are so many very talented young musicians. Um, well, I hope that I hope they get a chance to play. I want to talk about that. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we spoke before the show started uh, about the effect of you know electronics mm -hmm. on the kind of music you're talking about, the kind that the kind that you live with that lives in you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what, what, what are your thoughts about that? About how you know the advent of electronic music has changed our musical lives? Well, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, what a difference from being able to record something that's going on to creating it with electronics. You know, I mean, that's pretty much, it's gone the gamut from uh, just making a document of something with a single microphone and, you know, to take it or leave it, it's just what you played is how it went, right? Then they made some, then p p editing began just splicing different notes in and out, and then editing of the actual digitizing happened, and now they can move the pitches anywhere. They can move the volume and the acoustic, and everything can be changed by the engineer. So the engineer is also an artist now, with equal or greater billing on the recording. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, but it's having a strange effect on live music because well, some people can't play live music. Some people can only play in the studio, which is to me, I don't know. I, I, I like to know that there's a human being on the other side of the note. So, um, sure, it's like video. It's like this discussion. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. You know, if it, if it comes out a little bit off key, that. It's okay. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Now, listeners today can't accept wrong notes because there aren't any on recordings. You don't hear wrong notes. You don't hear a missed anything because they fix it. So there's no tolerance anymore for human error, which is too bad because we're still human. That's not going to change much, I don't think. I mean, unless something really major happens, I, I think we're all going to be human until the end, right? So we should be able to make a mistake or two. I mean, we're, we're going to take a short break. Okay. okay. Sure. Uh, on the notion of we're all human, <laughs> I'll go a step further and say we're all mammals, too. You know? <laughs> That's from Mika Wellington. I'm Jay Fidel. We're doing sound and music. We're talking about music in Hawaii. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel. I want to tell you about our program this month. We're doing a lunch and panel program at the Plaza Club with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech about China. It's Don't Be Afraid to Send Your Kid or CEO to China. Stories of daring do and of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness in the People's Republic. We want to introduce you to some people who have lived in China and show you that life in China is not so bad. It's not all about corruption and environmental degradation and lack of civil or human rights. It's not like that. And we want to have them tell you their day-to-day -day stories about how they've lived there. So our moderator is Larry Foster. He has taught uh, law in China, and he has taught, been practicing law in China for a firm in, uh, in Shanghai. His wife, Brenda Foster, is on the panel. Uh, she has been the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. We have Russell Liu. He's an attorney practicing with Shepard Mullen uh, in Beijing for quite some time. Shackley Ruffetto, a circuit court judge from Maui, who, uh, after retiring, went to China so he could teach judicial process there. And uh, Nikki Shishido, who has worked for DBED, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism of the State of Hawaii, uh, in Beijing for some time. All these people have had the experience of living on the ground in China. We want to have them tell their stories to you. So maybe this will encourage you to send your kid or CEO to China. So if you're interested in this program, which ought to be very interesting, come down on August 22nd. You can sign up at hvca.org. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We'll see you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel on Think Tech. Uh, today, Sound and Music on a given Friday. We're talking about live music education in Hawaii and lots more about music with Lumiko Wellington, a musician par excellence. My, excuse me for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> a musician in the heart, okay? And I'm really fully appreciated and I really enjoy having you on the show. Thank as you. As I have done in the past, as you know. So, uh, can we talk about what's going on now? You know, because Hawaii is such a great music tradition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, I mean, people talk about the culture, and sometimes it gets pretty vague exactly what the culture is. But we know one thing, music was at the center of it. Mm -hmm. And music is not there anymore, not, not so much anyway. Well, so what's, what's the situation? It's unclear to me, but I insist on being optimistic. I think, I mean, lately I've just been telling myself everything that goes up comes down. 
everything that goes down goes up. So if we're down now, there's an upcoming. There's, there's, you know, there's, we're going somewhere. You're never not going anywhere. So if you're not going down, you're going up. I mean, you know, I don't think we're going to do any sideways. You know, there's too little, there's too much going on for that. And different things are going up and down. I mean, there is still music in Hawaii quite a bit. Tell us about it. I mean, I like to know the venues that you're thinking of. And on the way in just now, I was hearing about a, a program that was uh, going to play at the Atherton. I'd forgotten the Atherton. Mm -hmm. You know, at HPR, they have a lot of music there. And There's, the churches, you know, have a mm -hmm. lot of music. Great stuff. I go to see it once in a while. Mm -hmm. And chamber music does chamber music. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Blaisdell's not doing nearly so much. The opera is struggling to keep a, a cohesive season, you know, because they don't have dates at the uh, at uh, Blaisdell. And that's uh, true. Um, I think that's going to work itself out um, I, I, because there's a new formula now. It's a little hard on the musicians that the season's gotten broken up, it, yeah. uh, and it's hard for planning purposes for the opera because they can't double up. The artists can't do two shows in a row now because they're not the two shows are not next yeah, to each so other. You have economy but, of scale. Right. But that just means you have to figure out a different way. And, and Henry is a hero to me because he always finds a way. He never says, well, we're not going to have an opera anymore. I mean, no, can't it doesn't, that. you can't even meet pensar. You don't even think about it. No. It's because it's, that's not how he is. So I'm thinking, you know, there'll be, there'll be opera. There's music. There's getting to be a lot of live music venues there are getting to be a lot of live music venues. <laughs> like right yeah, are you talking about are you talking about live music? Are you talking about classical music? Or are you talking about pops? Are you talking about every genre of music? There's quite a bit of jazz. Um, mm -hmm. Several that, places. That's where I saw you last at, at Don Gordon's. Uh, oh, at Studio Nine Hundred Nine. Service over yes. last weekend. Yeah. Then there's um, there's the Plaza Club. There's um, the mezzanine. Mm -hmm. It's called the Mets One Two Seven or something in Topa Center. There's uh, Jazz Minds. There's, and then I know there are a number of rock venues that I don't know much about. Um, not that I don't like rock and roll, but I don't like volume. I, the volume is just it hurts me, so I don't go. But um, there's quite a bit of musical theater. Um, Diamond Head, Manoa Valley. I think, I don't know, the Army still has something somewhere. Um, there's music. Is there enough? How can it be enough? I mean, it's never too much, is it? I miss the orchestra, but there soon will be orchestra starting in October, I believe. Promise me. I signed a paper, okay. so okay. we'll see. And um, Pops. One thing I think is good that I've been hoping will happen for a long time um, is that the pops and the, and, the, and the classical series are now separate. So it gives both series a chance to grow bigger. I think in a town of our size, which I found out recently is bigger than Boston, there's room. There's room for, even if it's two things on the same day, there are enough people. I mean, why shouldn't it be able to survive? I, I don't think that everything has to be on the symphony schedule. Is the uh, symphony and, and the pops the same audience or is it? It is? overlaps but it's but not it's, the same audience. Parts to yes. It, yeah. so um, is it a younger audience in the pops? Is that what it is? No. It's a different listening audience. It's mm -hmm. people who listen to different music. I don't think that some of the listeners are younger but I don't think that's the major difference. Uh, um, it's, it's just people who listen to different music and they should be able to, to do what they want. I mean, I think it eventually there should be a ballet season, an opera season, a pop season, and a classical season. All year round. And, or a lot of the year. Yeah. There's no reason not to do it, but if everything is on one contract, you can't expand because it's only 52 weeks. Yes. So I'm hoping, you know, that that will also expand the freelance market uh, for musicians, because right now, uh, for the young people who play, there's not a lot of work, because if you're not in the orchestra, what are you going to do? But if there were more work, there would be more room. Where does, so, where does Hawaiian music fit into all of that? 
there's a there's a lot of Hawaiian music, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. A, a lot of it is uh, in the hotels, in uh, weddings and parties and stuff like that. Fortunately, most of that music is live. You know, it's not recorded. There are quite a number of people who have two professions. They work, at, they do something in the day and something in the night. Um, Makaha Sun started that way. You know, they didn't play live, they didn't play music only for a long time. Um, so that's a, a hopeful place. You know, a lot of Hawaiian music is happening. Well, you, you, but you want it to happen more. I mean, at one time it was 10 feet tall. I mean, mm -hmm. going back to the 30s. But mm -hmm. Uh, Hamahali music in the Banyan courtyard there in the Moana Hotel, you know, being broadcast to the world and bringing tourists from every corner of the world mm -hmm, by, mm -hmm. by the romance of it. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that. And, and if you want to do music in, uh, in Hawaiian music uh, in Waikiki, you have to promote yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find a big promoter, and the hotels aren't going to promote you. So this makes it sort of fragmented. And, and it, it means that there are no great heroes emerging as, the, as there were. I don't know, the 50s, the 60s, right? Yeah, well, the great heroes are recording artists now. They're not people that you're going to see walking down Kalakaua Avenue anymore. That's the unfortunate part. Yeah. Um, and people who live here don't even go to Waikiki anymore because, you know, it's become a cement nightmare. It's, it's foreboding. It really and is. you can't see the ocean. Yeah. You can't see the ocean. How is, that's ridiculous. So, I mean, but I'm hopeful. I, I just think it can always, it can be better. It's going to be good. I think that uh, people are beginning to, li to value live music again because it's clear that things, many of the things that come from live music performances are going away. The sense of community, the, the sense of reciprocity, you know, that you, that you, you give and you get back. That, uh, that comes from the performer's side and from the audience side. And uh, that sense of ownership, you know, um, that you actually matter, is, I think people miss it. And so I think if they make it clear that they want more live music, more live music will happen. <clears throat> but would you agree with me? And I'm thinking uh, it, was, it was called the Hawaiian Regent Hotel, then mm -hmm. I call something else now, <clears throat> in the rooftop. They had local kind of mm -hmm. I mean, every weekend, mm -hmm. and they had, they had guys coming in from the neighbor islands. It was really, you know, spirited, mm -hmm. and it was wonderful to go there. And you'd, you know, have a hamburger and listen, and it was like old-fashioned times. Mm -hmm. It's not there anymore. In fact, there is nobody who's actually promoting it. And it's a matter of money. But there is the a Kanika Pila Grill, which is, uh, uh, it's, I, you know, I've never been there, but I know it's in Waikiki, and I know that it's a, it's a big deal on the weekends the best players go there and um, there's also Honey's in Kaneohe yeah. where the original Honey's was Don Ho's mom's place um, which was right at the end of Kaneohe and um, that was a spot you know where there was live music every night practically and the, the new place is uh, at the Ko'olau golf course and on weekends they have live music there um, a, a lot of the great players go there, and it's very informal, and you know. Well, it should be. Um, where else? You used to have something downtown in the Marx Building there, Marx Garage Building. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah oh, that was really something. Uh, and, uh, Dave, he died since. But oh uh, yes, I remember. I went to his memorial. I can't remember his last name. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about him today. He did a lot of... Remember his last name? I don't. I'm trying to remember it. Come back. He's a Jewish guy. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, there's there's stuff going on, but not it's it's not as much as it used to be. And the, the big hotels don't have... You know, there's no more Don Ho show. There's no more Danny Kalekini. You know, I mean, really, if you were... Let's just take it hypothetical, mm -hmm. okay? If I'm... If I have either money or clout with a hotel, mm -hmm. I say to the hotel, I'm going to find Joe Dokes. Mm -hmm. and you don't know him, but mm -hmm. I consider him very good. Mm -hmm. I've listened to him. I think mm -hmm. he's a star. I want to make him a star. So I'm going to take the, you know, the Royal Hawaiian Ballroom there. 
Mm -hmm. so, to me, that's always the place. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, and um, and I'm going to make that. I'm going to big big concert with everybody. Make mm -hmm. a dinner concert mm -hmm. out of it. And don't worry. I mean, I'll I'll front it. I'll be the promoter for it. Mm -hmm. I think people would come from miles around. It's just a matter of you know setting it up where somebody takes the risk. Mm -hmm. In order to promote, you've got to test the nature of a promoter. You got to mm -hmm. take the risk. Uh, but there's nobody doing that. Uh, that's what we need. Well, I I wonder what it would take actually to make that happen because now nobody's around for that many weeks in a year because they're always traveling. Yeah. Whether they travel because they have to or because they want to is the question, you know. The, most of the musicians I know, the Hawaiian musicians especially, spend most of the year touring. And so you could not put them in a, in a room. You couldn't put them in a showroom because they wouldn't be here. Yeah. They, I don't know if they would do it. Maybe they would. But, you know, I. Somebody we has don't to have figure it out. I the mean, problem, yet. Yeah. You say it will come back, and I, I agree that there are forces that tend to bring it back. Mm -hmm. But I think, wouldn't it be wonderful for Miko if we or our friends could actually make that happen? You know? Well, there's no question that we can make it happen. You know, I mean, it's that saying, uh, so you say it, so shall it be, right? You can make it happen, whatever you want. It's what you want that's the question. So. Um, and I think a bigger question is who does it benefit? Because if it's for everyone, everybody will want it, of course. When people feel included, they will support you. I think um, that has been a hitch in, in, the, in the planning of some of the live music things in our town for a while. Well, I want to talk about that in the context of classical music in a mm -hmm. minute. We we'll take a short break. That's Fumiko Wellington. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about sound and music and more specific live music in Hawaii. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, my name is Attila Saras, and I'm the host for Think Tech Friday, a weekly radio show about things that matter to Hawaii. You can tune in every Friday at thinktechhawaii.com. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. We were both in Europe at, at the same time, and um, then we both came back. Okay, we're back. We're live. We are? Again? Oh my Again, gosh. Again, we're live. We're still alive. Here we are. <laughs> we're still human. <laughs> we're still alive. <laughs> yeah, we're both still alive. Wow. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about music, especially live music in Hawaii. You run sound and music on a given Friday. So, you know, in the break, we were talking about, uh, you know, live orchestral music, mm -hmm. which, you know, to me, that's the, the mark of a community, sorry to say. That's the mark of the community, and, and any community worth its salt must have that. And we've had such fits and starts, such ups and downs. And I was reminiscing about, uh, you know, the the failure of the uh, symphony back in the middle 90s, and how um, Mario Ramos, who was the opera director at the mm -hmm. time, tried to establish uh, an alternative uh, orchestra. Mm -hmm. And it was called, interestingly enough, it was called the Hawaii Symphony, mm -hmm. but it also failed mm -hmm. you know, for lots of complicated reasons. And you know, if, if you had to draw a trajectory, I'm uh, sorry to say on this, you know, things haven't done as well as they used to be doing. We used to have a pretty robust orchestra and supporters for the orchestra. It was as, you know, as robust as it might be in this city. Now it's always a struggle. What is that? Mm -hmm. 
wow, where, where do I go with this? You know, uh, in defense of the orchestra, I think the orchestra and the committee, the support for the orchestra is almost two different discussions. I agree. Because the orchestra, when it played, in my memory, uh, I have not been here all the time. I, I was gone for more than 20 years. But when I was here, uh, before I left, when I was young, and the orchestra was one of the major orchestras in our country, the level of playing was very high. And when I came back, it was there too, when the orchestra was playing. And then every time the orchestra stopped playing, we had to reboot. But it always came back. And uh, our orchestra has, is admired internationally. It's not, a, you know, we, people don't think of it as a regional orchestra really, because the playing is very high level. Um, our players, when they leave, when they you know, finally can't stay anymore, they end up in the, the L.A., San Francisco, Boston. I mean, they're everywhere. Like National. Mike, Mike Gorman, for example, we yeah. talked about him. Uh, I mean, it's a great the, loss to Hawaii. Uh, of course. But Every player that Hawaii. leaves is, is a loss because it's part of the ensemble. So that's something that a lot of people don't realize. It's not just a job. It's not like you can get another temp, you know. You, you spend a long time in the orchestra before you really fit. And when a piece falls out, it leaves a hole. So that's something we have to recover every time. Now we're bleeding a lot because we've lost so many players. Now it's almost like a new orchestra. And um, it, you can't just put money in. You know, you can't just put a quarter and expect it to play because we have to build that ensemble again. Part of that is fun, but it's a tremendous amount of work and it takes time. It doesn't, you can't just turn it on and off. So um, we have some work to do now. And uh, in terms of the support, I mean, there's, there's a group of people that have always supported the orchestra. But it's not that big of a group, I must say. And that, I think that is the problem. And the people who are not interested in the orchestra, many of them feel that the orchestra was not there for them. And, and that is a serious, before. that's a serious uh, uh, problem. Inclusivity. When people think it's for them, like a parade is for everyone, um, they're in it, you know. And I think an orchestra is something like a parade because it's big, you know. It's something big, and it should include everybody because it's a sign of our largesse. I mean, it's a, it's a sign of of it's a status thing for our town, for our state, you know. I mean, uh, it should be for everyone, and and that's. I mean, I have met so many children that have never heard an orchestra. They, you know, they live so far away. They can't spare any more school days to get on the bus and come for 45 minutes. To the, so they don't come anymore because there aren't enough school days anymore. They can't lose one. So either the orchestra has to go out there or, you know, um, no, some not, kids don't have the money. Not incentivized in some way to study it, like it, appreciate it, you know, uh, learn it. Um, then you don't care. And when you get to be an adult, you don't care. And I think there's a lot of people in the community now who were brought up without that, and they don't care. Well, that Which goes for a lot of things, too. For, well, it's true. Yeah. It's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. But you can't tap them for money. They're not going to spend money for the tickets. They're not going to write checks. Well, because they don't know what it is. Yeah. That's what the difference is between now and when I was small and every school had an orchestra, whatever kind of orchestra it was. I mean, there was... Every year was a big music festival, the Parade of Orchestras, and a festival of solo and ensemble music. It was a big deal. You wore your best clothes. Every school turned out. It was a festival. I mean, it was a big, everybody got really excited. It was kind of like the homecoming game or, you know. Now, there's still something, but it doesn't include all the schools because not all the schools have music. Some schools barely have any music at all. And they certainly don't all have orchestras and bands. Um, orchestra band, marching band. I mean, you know, there was a lot of music a lo once upon a time. Mm -hmm. And um, well, what, what, what it's about different. Uh, the, uh, what was it, the Youth Symphony, Henry Miyamura? Henry the Youth Miyamura. Symphony is very strong. I'm hoping that that continues because part of the backbone has been the orchestra. That's where all the teachers are. The, the great majority of the teachers uh, are symphony players. And um, 
well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just worry that uh, it's, it's great and it's uh, at a high level. I see the orchestra itself. The Youth uh, Symphony been. plays brilliantly, and I, I must say it's grown from one orchestra to many. You know, there's, yeah. and they are very well organized. They travel, they have tutors, they have small ensembles, big ensembles, coaches, you know, it's great. I would like to see them, as in Detroit, for instance, rehearse in the hall. They, you know, in Detroit, despite the lack of funding, I don't know where they get the money, but there are five youth orchestras in Detroit. They rehearse in Symphony Hall. They, they have coaches well, from the orchestra here do that. Why not? I mean, yeah. it, it it could happen. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, let me just throw this at you because you're on the on the ground with it. But it seems to me that it's that that you need to move people around. You need to have people from one island go to another island. Mm -hmm. Orchestra from one island play in another island. You have to you have to raise all the boats. <laughs> and uh, traveling now is so expensive. There isn't any ferry. There isn't any sea flight. There's only the plane, and the plane is 250 or 275, even for a nine-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and the airlines are still losing money, so yeah. you know it's not just expensive for us. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the result though is that if you have, if you have some talent or some orchestral ensemble phenomenon in one island, you can't easily get to another island. So the other island goes without. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, though. Nobody ever said it would be easy. It's like, you know, it's not easy to play the trumpet. It's not easy to play the violin. So what? It has nothing to do with it. It's important to play, though. So you find a way to do it. There's a way to do it all. There what, is a what way. What is the way? I mean, I, I, we're at a point in the show where we should ask you what, well, what we need to do. What do we need to do? Well, I think, you know, we, we hear over and over again that we need to build awareness. I mean, I think the way to do that is to let people experience it. We have to make it possible for everybody to hear the music, uh, to touch it. I don't think it's a good thing. It's not going to change anything if everybody sees it on TV. It's, and, you know, it's not going to change it if everybody comes to a school concert. It will change when everybody sits in the hall when it's a concert. concert. You know, I think the kids should come sit in the hall when it's a real concert. That's something. I mean, you feel it. It's not the same. It's not a school little 45-minute thing where they, I mean, those concerts are great, but it's not the same. I mean, when, when Ozawa was here to conduct the orchestra, the first thing he asked was, where are the children? That's what he said. Why are there no children? Why aren't there rows of children in the front? Why not? Yeah. Indeed. I mean, you know, and we always have empty seats. It's not like we couldn't find somebody to put in them, but we didn't. Could have so, given yeah. them free seats, it would have been okay. Nobody well, was going to pay for those seats anyway. <laughs> well, we do pay for them. That's the thing. Oh, you mean to pay the hall? Yeah, yeah we pay. Yeah. We do pay for them. So where do we where do we start on this? Let's you and me make a plan. Where do we start? How do we how do we recapture the music uh, tradition of the state? How do we uh, get those kids in the front rows? Um, how do we get them into music programs? How do we get, how do we spread that around throughout every county? How do we? Well, the simplest thing to do is bring someone. You know, I mean, that's, I remember my father telling me that he, the first time he heard an orchestra, it was uh, Arthur Fiedler, you know, conducting the Boston Pops. He said, I was still wearing short pants, because that was in the days when you didn't get long pants until you were in seventh grade or eighth grade, I don't know. And he said, somebody and took him. Tomorrow was his birthday? Yesterday was his Yesterday birthday. Yesterday was his yeah. birthday? He, he said... He was 97 years old. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> he said that he never forgot it. I mean, from the, that day, he knew that he wanted to be a musician. He, wa he wanted to be in it. Because, you know, Orchestra Hall, how could you not want to do that? How could you not think that's fantastic? But, and you have to be there as a kid, you know, and, and be surrounded by all of that, the sound and the, the pageantry and the whole thing. Passion. Yeah. I mean, come on. Bring yeah. someone. I, I think that people should. And that I was just listening um, on the way here to the radio about, you know, the, the Aspen Festival, and they were saying how much live music there is in the streets during the festival. There's music everywhere, the bakeries, cafes, there's just people on the street, everybody's throwing dollars into a hat or 
but it's really high level music, why not? I mean, why not do it? I was in Paris um, a few months ago mm -hmm. in the subway. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we all remember the musicians that play with their hats out mm -hmm. and you throw you know, some money in the hat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this time was different. This time at one particular uh, intersection of tunnels mm -hmm. in the Paris subway, the mm -hmm. metro, there was a full orchestra. Oh my! <laughs> Probably had to be 50 people, 60 wow. people down wow. there, all playing together, and the crowd heard it all the way down the other ends of those tunnels. Sure. Everybody came to see. That's and, fantastic. And they were selling CDs. And oh really? It was really something. But it was a festival, and you're right. I mean, it's the festival thing that, that we have mm -hmm. to achieve. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now they um, they talk about uh, having a kind of a food festival in Kakaako. They have a food festival. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to make, I mean, I'm not sure how long this is going to last, but a festival, you know, atmosphere. Uh, if we could achieve that here, why? We have the music, why don't we do that? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't some, excuse the expression, promoter uh, get out there and make a festival? What all he needs is a, is a hall, some space, and he can bring down everybody who even half likes to play, right? Well, here's the thing. The, I mean, here's a major difference. When you have... Uh, what is it called? Eat the street, or you know these food festivals. It's for everyone. Yeah. There's no exclusivity about it. Yeah. I mean, you can know about it or not know about it. There's that that could be considered exclusive, but everybody knows about it. It's all over the place, yeah. and everybody goes because everybody can go. It's affordable. That's what we need. It needs to be for everyone. It needs to be affordable on some level for everyone. I don't really believe that the way to make it work is to give away tickets. I think when, when it's free, it should be free for everyone. It should not be free for some people and other people pay a ton of money, yeah, yeah. which is how it's been in the past. Inclusive, yeah. Inclusivity thing. Um, I think whatever, everybody should share whatever the cost is. If it's nothing, then it should be nothing. And if it's something, then it should be something for everyone. In the past, we've had you know, the tradition of comps with the orchestra, which I'm against completely. I think, I mean, when we, the orchestra used to be able to buy tickets for their friends, and I never gave comps. I, if my friends didn't have money, I bought their tickets, because I think the ticket should have a value. You have to maintain it, the value. It, it's not a free ticket. Free is not free. Cheap is not cheap. And, you know, you lower the bar to that level, you can never recover, because people expect them. They want you to give them the ticket every time. And I, but they don't go into a shoe store and say, give me those shoes. They don't go into a restaurant and say, oh, well, <laughs> I'm not going to pay for it. You can't, you, no. But with music, you know, you're supposed to be privileged to, for exposure. No. I mean, no. It costs something. It costs me something to play. I should at least be able to eat, right? So um, I am not a person in favor of comps. But, but I do think that the music should be for everyone. On some, there should be concerts, more concerts in the park. There should be more. Like when I was in New York a couple of weeks ago, it was you know every orchestra is playing in the park. It's 150,000 degrees, but still they come in droves, and you know they bring their bottled water and their whatever. Now we can't do that either because the Shell, for instance, uh, you can't bring bottled water there anymore. You can't bring anything. Why is there a reason? A good reason? Anybody? I don't know what the good reason would be there it because you get checked your bag gets checked when you come to the oh, gate for, for security and yeah so you cannot bring food or drink into the park you can buy it when you're inside but that eliminates a lot of people who sure. would never be able to pay you know sure. there's it used to be everybody it brought their La Hala mat and it was like cheap enough for people to bring the kids that were too young to listen and they would just sleep it didn't matter yeah. they just you know the everybody else listened or they lasted as long as they lasted and they would pass out on the lawn, no problem. Now it's not like that. And I, we need, that's what we're hoping to establish in Kakaako Makai now, um, a place where people, everybody can come to listen. Simple, simple, nothing fancy. Well, there's a big uh, outdoor uh, theater there. Yes, and yes. It's never been used as far as I it know. It gets used, but rarely. It's starting to be used more, well, but we need a place that? that we could, but we need a place that's covered because when you have, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of instruments if it rains you cannot Disaster. sacrifice it needs to be you know there needs to be some shelter but it doesn't have to be fancy it Did just needs to be 
Yeah, you could. Or just over the, you know, the orchestra. But something simple, you know, I mean, um, so that we can have concerts where anybody can come in their bathing suit or their shorts or their whatever, and it can be very inexpensive, but we can have music, you know. So I, and that could be for music of every sort, Hawaiian music, classical music, symphonic music, the up? band, why not? I mean, why not? Just music. Yeah. A music festival in the fullest sense. There's lots of it coming from all sides. Yeah. Live music. Live music. And song? Absolutely. Why not? Wow, we got it. Well, do music, this. it is song, though. <laughs> you know, right? So, yeah, we have to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, how about you? I mean, what, what is your plan? I mean, uh, you've, oh, you've been gosh. ups and downs with the ups and downs of the orchestra. And here you are, you, you know, you're going to go play in October, Knockwood. Mm -hmm. um, so what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like for you, assuming things come back the way you want? What it's going to be like for me is a mystery right now, because I don't know what to expect in terms of an orchestra. I, I don't know who will be there. I know some people who will not be there, but um, I'm guessing we're going to have some building time to put the ensemble back, you know, together. I hope and, so. Um, that means playing. We're very fortunate that we have... Rehearsing and all Oh, that. yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I love rehearsal. I love rehearsal. But I also love the concerts where the, everybody comes to listen. But we're very lucky that we have Joanne Folletta uh, who will come help us. She's one of the greatest people. She's so positive and um, she lets everybody play. She's, you know... She's very supportive of everybody. That's great. And that is wonderful for us. So I'm looking forward to it, but I don't really know what to expect, I, I must say. Big adventure for all of us, I think. Yes. See whether it works. Everybody counting. It will hoping. work in some way. It will work. But what's uh, the best way it would work, and what's the not so best way? The best way would be that next year we play more. Uh, the best way would be that people want added concerts now, you know, that we can tack weeks on now. It's doable, certainly, because the musicians are wanting to play. Um, the, the best thing would include uh, a lot of education events so that more people can hear what an orchestra is. Um, and I would like to see more happen in terms of you know the different kinds of playing that the ballet the opera so that some of the young people who are studying now can start working here because there's no room for them right now and that's a problem you mean no jobs yeah there's there's no place for them to play they can play maybe some musical theater things sometimes not enough uh, it's not enough work, well and it's also not the kind of training that they need uh, to go forward as orchestra musicians or as you know they need to I started when I was very young playing in the orchestra because there was a need for players in the orchestra and so I was lucky I and a few other players that are still playing um, started playing in the orchestra when we were teaching teenagers but kids now don't have that there's no room for them so uh, because the orchestra is a little smaller now than it was um, so the ones who really want to play go away, and then sometimes they don't come back. Sure. It's and that's, so that's too bad, because we, we have some very great players in, amongst the students. But once they go away, you know, it's... Yeah. Let me tell you some thoughts I have about how to... Okay, make yeah, this, make please. This and see if you agree. Okay. You know, maybe, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, I, think, I think there ought to be more of this, mm -hmm. you know, with some media, any mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. where the people get to know you. Because I think they're used to, the whole generation, the last two or three generations, mm -hmm. have learned music electronically. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very nice, it's perfect, but it, it has no human face to it. Mm -hmm. It's just music on a machine. Mm -hmm. uh, they should know you. And when they go to see, they will see you in the pit. They will see you with the violin. They will look for your sound. Mm -hmm. They will look for your facial expressions and your body language. They will see them all connect up. That's, the, to me, the true music. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have to know you. They have to know everybody. There should be stars. Uh, or everyone. Everybody is a star in that, in that pit. 
uh, and the public should have, like soccer, you know, they should have their heroes on the field. Well, and they should know too that we're regular people. Yeah. You know, the thing, <laughs> I always invite people uh, to come to the rail at opera. I always invite people backstage. You know, I say, I will come to see you. If you come to the, to the gate, I will come to visit with you because I love to do that. And once they know you, you know, they feel like they're coming to see a friend, which is great. But the opposite side of it is you're never off stage because I have been confronted at, you know, Safeway at two in the morning when I think <laughs> nobody will see me. And I mean, literally, I'm wearing my yuckiest t-shirt and my hair is just and then somebody will come up to me and say aren't you a violinist with the arm I'm like oh the no no yeah and you know you just think oh really now well and that you know so you always have to sort of know somebody might see you somebody but then they get to know that you also shop at Costco you also <laughs> you know okay. yeah you know, I mean, it, 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 it makes it human. Yeah, they, well, I mean, because people think that we live these glamorous lives because when they see us, we're in tails or, you know, the tux, the velvet dress or the whatever stockings. And that's not how I live. Yeah. I mean, you know, I wear shorts most of the time or something. Well, I, I, well, I, I'd like to see you at Safeway sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you keep talking to food. And you I have seen you at Costco, that's right? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph and Nico, it's been great to talk with you, and I can only say that I, you know, my 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 track of this discussion, my feeling about it is that we have to do more of it, and maybe with some of your friends too. Absolutely. Come down and, and, and reveal and disclose and how how your lives are going, how your music is going, how you feel about it, how you want people, how you want them to feel. About it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, thank you so much. Also, I feel good. You know, I feel good about it. I think that there's. A great deal of hope. So, well, let's just do okay, it. Well, tell them how they can sign up for the October concert. There's a website, which I believe is up and running. It must be hawaiisymphony.org or something like that. Yeah, okay. And there's a symphony office that's open on Wailai. Um More. That's enough. Watch the papers. Yeah. Google it. You know, Google Fumiko Wellington, you oh, find, you oh, find out a lot. <laughs> and you know, I come down to that concert because uh, at that concert you look into the pit or on the stage, however it's set up, mm -hmm. and um, and you will see her. She'll be there. She'll be playing the violin, uh, <laughs> and, and you will know her from this discussion. And you'll feel differently about the music because you do know her. Thank you, Fumiko. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll be back in uh, an hour or so with. Uh, uh, Think Tech Friday, and uh, and of course next week, every week, um, two or three shows every afternoon. So watch us on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions, and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo.